Hello and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Ant and I'm here with my two friends, Will and Anna. Hello. Hello. Season's greetings. Season's greetings. Uh, This week, we have been instructed by the random number generator to conduct a very special Christmas episode, whereby we are allowed to choose any year we like and come up with a fact from uh, Christmas. So, as is custom, I would like each of us to give a three-word preview of what we're discussing today. Will? Stone of Destiny. (laughs) (laughs) Anna? Whiskey, Tango, Foxtrot. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> and mine is worst Christmas ever. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Are you just going to tell a painful story from your childhood? It, it, this is, yeah, this is a 1991 <laughs> when I did not get the Atari that I wanted. This is, that was a sad Christmas for a us very all. Very sad Christmas. <laughs> cool. Onwards. <laughs> I would like to use the stage that I've been given oh, by the RNG to talk about any year in history mm-hmm. to finally shine a light on the cabal that is the Medici family. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, just when I thought they were out of your system. And by the end of this, you will indeed agree with me that they are behind everything. Good. <laughs> non plus looks from everyone. But uh, of course, to remind everyone, the Medicis, as well as being a powerful family and cabal in Florence during the Renaissance, uh, they were bankers and merchants and they had their tendrils spread into all aspects of society, whether that's culture, art, religion, banking, food, football. Um, and, 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 and Camel football, racing. Camel racing. And as a start, um, they also had their tendrils deep into Christmas. And Hang I, on, are you, before you get in there, you've said tendrils now a couple mm, of times. Yeah. Are you insinuating some sort of non-humanoid I'm just appendage? saying that someone should look, look do your own research <laughs> okay. into the Medici okay. squid conspiracy. <laughs> okay, there's potential. Oh, uh, squid? Yeah, well, than uh, maybe not squid, just reptiles. some, some cellopod of some sort. I'm I mean, saying. the Medici squid conspiracy is an Excellent name for a band. <laughs> but to bring it back to Christmas, though. Uh, so how, have we been on Christmas so far? Yes. we this, are, we're, Oh, well, this whole episode is about Christmas. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, I, ho- I hope you know that. <laughs> but specifically, now is the Christmas part. I would like right. you to think about what is the absolute core epicenter of Christmas itself? The real central point. What the is birth it? of Christ Jesus. Wrong. <laughs> Will. Uh... Easter eggs. Wrong. (laughs) Turkey. The worst meat. So in Renaissance Italy, the humble turkey, as we now know it, was thought of to be exotic, delicious bird. And it came across from the Americas, of course. And uh, it sometimes came through the trade routes through Turkey, hence why it was called a turkey. Mm. Um, But it it was, you know, it beat out all the other odd birds that they were still eating Hang on, you can't just breeze past that really interesting Mm -hmm. fact. Is that true? That That's why we call it turkey. That's why we call it turkey. Well, that's the the etymology of it is like kind of difficult to decipher, but that's probably one of the reasons why it's called turkey because one of the trade routes where they brought all the turkeys back came via turkey and then promulgated throughout the rest of Europe. And it was seen as an exotic, delicious, exquisite bird because they were already eating heron and uh, crane. That's a gamey meat. Yeah, Yeah, it is gamey. gamey Uh, And seagull. (laughs) Maybe not seagull, but like all the bad birds that we don't eat anymore. And so turkey was seen as like this, you know, wonderful, exotic, succulent, beautiful, gobbly sounding Mm -hmm. meat, which was very unusual (laughs) for birds Mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and, And as a result... Turkeys pop up at the epicenter of art in the 1500s, commemorated with enthusiasm that would normally be reserved for like the noble animals such as dogs, horses, horses yeah. uh, boats, bowls of fruit, <laughs> um, <laughs> tactical, not, rabbit. tactical, t- tactical rabbit, tactical, um, tactical rabbit, and none other than Cardinal Giolo de Medici uh, commissioned uh, some uh, artwork to the to the noble turkey. He would go on to become Pope. Clement 
the seventh, no doubt due to his uh, deep-seated roots to the Medicis and the Turkey trade. And he commissioned a fresco that's still visible in the Villa Madama, just outside Rome. Twenty years later, once again, the the esoteric symbol- symbolism of the turkey <laughs> is brought back to life by his relation Galo, uh, the relation of Galo. Cosimo de' Medici, which uh-huh. we have come across before. Yeah, we have. Okay. He's a big one. And he had an image of a turkey woven into a tapestry depicting the bounties offered by a personified finger of abundance, which is just like a big fat turkey giving out gifts, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, hang on, you 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 are asserting that the Med- uh, the Medicis believed that uh, a turkey was Father Christmas. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, yes. I just want to see, I want so, to put you on record as saying Yeah, that. exactly. And it, it's like with the squid and the turkey, there's some sort of surf and turf combination here. I, I think <laughs> <laughs> no, we should probably reinvestigate. Uh-huh. Anyway, anyway, How does a turkey give out gifts? <laughs> well, I, it can I, sort of just like flap its wings yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. a bag until it falls over and a present. But how does out. it grasp in a thing? See, well, this this kind of technology the Medici's have been Mentally? trying to keep down for years, right? They don't want you to know ancient technology of the, the turkeys. Anyway, um, can turkeys fly? No, no. Uh, they, they can maybe flap a bit, they like can chickens. Kind of flap a bit. Yeah, yeah, like chickens. They yeah, can't yeah, soar yeah. through I don't, the air. I don't think they majestically soar. No. God, I wish everyone <laughs> could be in the room right now. Will is pantomiming a turkey giving out Christmas <laughs> presents. It's very elbow related. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> He's going to break something. Additionally, there's a freestanding statue of a turkey that can still be seen in Florence today. Just FYI. Okay. So uh, the only good thing worth seeing in Florence, I think. I've never been to Florence. I'm sure. <laughs> is that great. true? Or you I just, think it's. I think that, the machine that... is pretty good there. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, uh, but but I'm going to talk to you about a like a specific Christmas, a nightmare before Christmas as it was known. Um, that was uh, before the turkey sort of came into the scene in 1478. It was a very tumultuous time for the Medicis. They had been warring with the Pazzi family, P-A-Z-Z-I, and they wanted, who wanted to wrest control from the Medicis for Florence. Uh, and this was caused by a rift between the Medicis and the Pope, and they tried to seize power because... The Medicis wanted to buy a town because, you know, YOLO, they sure. were very rich. Yep. And the Pope actually gazumped them and they said, mm. uh, no, I want to buy this town for a lesser price. And as part of the deal, uh, you, Mayor, you can marry your daughter off to my illegitimate son. Um, the Pope? The Pope's illegitimate son. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so as a result, the Medicis and Pope Sixtus they were clashing. Funny thing is, was that, that that Pope Sixtus was actually trying to borrow the money to purchase this town from the Medici themselves. Oh wow! So <laughs> they couldn't really like drum up the money, and so this has caused caused a uh, they didn't honor, honor the loan and caused a bit of a rift between the Pope. It caused a what? A rift. Oh okay. A rift, like not a temporal or space time rift or anything, but just like a just yeah, like a, I was an, a argy bargy as it were. Okay. Uh, and, and and thus the argy bargy plot was formed. Um, Guillermo Riario, Francesco Salviati, and Francesco de Pazzi conv- uh, convened together a plot to assassinate the two senior Medici's. That was Lorenzo and Giallano. But wait, hang Giuliano. on. They were they like they had been so, gazumped. Why did they no, also because, need to get killed? Because they because they knew that the. The 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 the, the, the Pazzi could now seize control of the Medici's land because the Pope was against them. They could side with the Pope and uh, push them out. So and they're just going to kill him, kill the Medici's to really exactly. add insult to injury, exactly. and then take over the lands, the money, and take over the banking Rude. and the turkeys and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so Pope Sixtus was approached to see, do you want to come into the plot? I know mm-hmm. you hate the Medici's. We hate the Medici's. We can push them out together. Um, he was he was Pope, so he couldn't really condone killing directly, uh, but he did write a letter saying he was like I'm unable to sanction sanction killings but it would be of great benefit to the papacy to have the Medici removed from their position of power and that I will deal kindly with anyone who did this Mm -hmm. and I instruct you to do whatever you deem necessary to achieve the same and I will give you whatever support I can so wow that is very explicit and I mean, fulsome report. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah exactly. that is just like he doesn't even have to wink at that no, point. No, no, there's no <laughs> winking or nodding. Um, the attack took place at High Mass uh, in 1478 during a Sunday. Lorenzo and Giuliano were seized upon. Lorenzo escaped out the back door, but Giuliano was killed. And uh, there's all this family intrigue and plotting. The Florentines, who had previously pledged support to the Pazzi, reneged. And as a result, more bloody battling and retributions were ha- took place. 30 people died that day and their bodies were hanged from the windows of the church. Oh, my God. Wait, this was on Christmas Day? The, but this, this was on April. Oh, okay. in April. Okay. Okay. But we're get, like, there was... Okay, you're setting the scene. <laughs> yeah, I'm setting the scene. Yeah, I'm setting okay. the scene. Okay. Um, um, 
So 30 people hanged. The Pazzi family had to flee. The ha- head of the Pazzi family, uh, Jacopo de Pazzi, was hanged uh, next to the decomposing corpse of his kingsman, Sal- Salviati, who was part of this conspiracy. Um, he didn't have a great time even after that because he was buried, dug up, thrown into a ditch, then dragged through the streets and propped up at the door of his plazo where the rotting head was mockingly used as a door knocker. Oof. Wow. From there, it was thrown in a river. Children fished it out and hung it from a willow tree, <laughs> flogged it, and then threw it back in the river. This is something that I've always, that has always like, fascinated me about this time in history, or really any time up until the medieval. Like, if I saw a head in the street, I wouldn't be like, cool, football. <laughs> door knocker. <laughs> I would, I would yeah, yeah, yeah. scream until I passed out. <laughs> How do you use it mockingly as a door knocker as yeah. opposed to just like, you know, seriously? Yeah, as seriously. A door yeah, yeah, reverently as a door knocker. A, a reverent door knocker. <laughs> just doing comic, lighthearted knocks of it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the year after this descended into barbaric chaos, retributions, counter retributions, counter counter retributions. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we've got a record from Christmas Eve in 1478 from a very famous uh, chap called Luca Landuccio, who's a famous diarist from that time. Uh, and he's bemoaning how Christmas was cancelled that year. It's a terrible time. There's plague, pestilence, etc. And his quote is, A peasant of the neighbourhood belonging to the Polpolsheki was found dead in his house, having hung himself with a towel. And during these days, the river was very high and overflowed its banks opposite Bogania's house. It caused great damage. The plague was also causing much mor- mortality. It pleased God to chastise us. And at this Christmas time, what with the terror of war, the plague and the papal excommunications, the citizens were in a sorry plight. They lived in dread and no one had the heart to work. The poor creatures could not procure silk or wool or only very little so that all classes suffered. And so without any silk or wool, <laughs> and warring families yeah. I would like to proclaim this uh, this year in 1478 to be the worst Christmas ever 1478 wow. worst Christmas ever no silk or only a little only a little no silk turkeys running rampant over the mm-hmm. streets of Florence Yeah, handing, handing out gifts willy nilly handing out gifts flapping their wings. All because the Medicis secretly control everything behind the deep state. They have their hands in all the wool and the silk. I mean, listen, <laughs> trade routes. You, this really proves, like, you come at the come at the king, you best not miss, you, right? You like, absolutely. <laughs> sorry to the Pazis, but honestly, if I go, if I disappear by next week, you know where it's been. I've, I've upset the Medicis. <laughs> all right. Well, um, if you're listening and you'd like to fill in for Ant uh, during his (laughs) leave of absence. Uh, Get in touch. I would challenge Turkey as the central (laughs) consumable of Christmas, and I'm going to put forth that it is, in fact, eggnog. Okay. Now, okay, this is going to... Don't... This might be a dumb question, but eggnog's a thing here. No particularly not I, in as big a way right I, I i only know it from like american movies yes okay okay and so i it think is, it's made from egg white it's cinnamon like, and liquor of that's, some sort. yeah basically i mean it's like drinking heavy cream that has Ugh. also been flavored with sugar and nutmeg uh, the, it is it, so rich yeah, are there eggs in it uh yeah i think it's egg yolks or whites okay, i don't yeah, know i've yeah, never okay. made it you yeah, just yeah. buy it and it's a thing where like you can drink well, I can drink like a thimbleful, and then oh, I have yeah, to go fine. sit down for a while. Yeah, yeah, um, gotcha. So it's very, very rich, and it has historically been uh, flavored with rum or brandy or yeah. whiskey. Today's story it takes place at West Point, mm. the U.S. Military Academy, and uh, nothing more festive than a little bit of the military. It is Christmas, 1826. And we're in West Point, which is on the banks of the Hudson River, just upriver from New York City. Um, And one thing to know about West Point uh, at this point is it was founded in 1802, but it was basically just like a ramshackle couple of buildings, 10 cadets, three teachers, not at all the, the really professional academy that it is today. It was basically a shambles. But after the War of 1812, where the U.S. didn't do great, um, the powers that be in the U.S. government decided to professionalize the army and started with West Point. 
So they appointed as superintendent a man named Sylvanus Thayer. Hmm. And he was a strict disciplinarian. He took away several privileges the cadets had enjoyed, uh, such as they were no longer able to leave campus, they were no longer able to cook in their dorms, and they were no longer able to duel each other. Mm. <laughs> Just sad. That is very sad. Um, most importantly, they were no longer able to consume alcohol, ah. except on the 4th of July, Independence Day, and on Christmas. But there was a very rowdy 4th of July party in 1825 when the boys performed a snake dance <laughs> and hoisted the commandant of the school on their shoulders. What oh. is a snake dance? Oh, it sounds, it sounds naughty. Delightful. <laughs> so after that, even alcohol on the 4th of July and on Christmas was taken away because yeah. the snake dance was too rowdy. It was too rowdy. It was so salacious. Yeah. Salacious. Uh, but of course, these being, you know, 18 to 20 year old men, they, they found a way to drink. Yeah. Uh, snake's gonna snake. Snake's gonna snake, as they say. <laughs> Jefferson Davis, who later became the president of the Confederacy, was at West Point at the time and was a notorious drunk. He was the first student to be arrested for going to one of the taverns near campus. And one time he was running back from that tavern uh, because he heard that they were, they were coming from an, an, for an inspection or something. And he was so drunk that he fell down a 60-foot ravine oh, God. <laughs> and had to go to the hospital and everything. I think that explains a lot about the Confederacy. Um <sighs> Anyway, in 1826, preparations are being made for the annual Christmas party at West, at West Point, where there would be eggnog, but there would not be alcohol oh. because of the propensity for snake dances. The students were very excited for the eggnog, but pissed that Colonel Thayer wouldn't let them put whiskey in it. So a few days before Christmas, several of them took matters into their own hands. They rode across the Hudson River to a tavern and smuggled back three or four gallons of contraband whiskey to put into the eggnog. They bribed the enlisted soldier on guard the princely sum of 35 cents. Mm -hmm. and he turned his back and they were able to unload the boat. Um, on Christmas Eve... The official party ended at night, but then the afters kept raging. Uh, it started among nine cadets in the North Barracks and a handful of other cadets in an adjoining room, including Jefferson Davis. They were carousing um, with their whiskey and their eggnog, and they had managed to avoid detection. But by 4 a.m., so this is now early on Christmas yeah, morning. So after the party, af the hotel lobby? Yeah, yeah, after the party is the after party. and the, Yeah, now we're in the hotel lobby. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> And around about four, they got to clear the lobby, which is where we're at, <laughs> amazingly. Uh, so the noise is too much, and it wakes up Captain Ethan Allen Hitchcock, a professor of military tactics. He's on his way to investigate the party, and he runs into Jefferson Davis, who is pissed out of his mind, and who bursts into the room at the same time as Captain Hitchcock and screams, put away the grog, boys, Captain Hitchcock's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and Hitchcock's there like, well... Astutely observed, Davis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hitchcock finds a scene. There's students passed out on the bed, two more hiding under a blanket, another one using his hat to cover his face. <laughs> and he, re he refuses to move his hat so that he can't be identified. No, genius. Um, and Hitchcock is, is pissed. He's uh, sorry, pissed in the angry sense. Uh, he gives them a, a stern lecture. He orders them back to bed. Jefferson Davis actually complies and goes back to his room, which turns out to be a great decision. Um, in another barracks earlier in the night, Lieutenant William Thornton had also been patrolling the grounds, found another party, and then was attacked by two students, one of whom threatened him with a sword and the other who ha hit him on the head with a piece of wood. Hell. And back in the barracks where Hitchcock is, after the lecture is over, one of the cadets actually fires a gun at him, huh. but it misses. So, as you can imagine, this is when it really kicks off. Thornton and Hitchcock are running around, desperately trying to restore order. But then one of the boys shouts, get your dirks and bayonets and pistols if you have them. Before this night is over, Hitchcock will be dead. Bloody hell. What? <laughs> I know. 
I mean, I'm not a military lawyer, but that does sound insubordinate. Yeah, I would say, yeah, gentle insubordination. Gen- mild. <laughs> mild. Mild, mild treason. Mild to moderate insubordination. Uh, the, there's also a rumor spreading among the cadets that Hitchcock is summoning the um, bombardiers, that, who are this, these regular artillery corps stationed at West Point and the cadets hate the artillery so the cadets start stocking up arms and preparing to defend the barracks from where they think Hitchcock has ordered yeah. the atil- artillery to attack them so so wait, so they, they thought that they could just get some grog yeah shoot at people and yeah. they think the natural escalation point was them to call in the artillery yeah. and bombard them yeah. like haul some cannons up a hill and <laughs> blow up the barracks where these students are I would say maybe not everyone was thinking clearly. I mean, on this I kind of blame their like military tactics teacher for this. Ironically, Hitchcock. <laughs> Hitchcock, yeah. So. <laughs> this trouble seems entirely of their own making. Oh yes. Well, this is what the you know what booze will do to you, which is <laughs> mm. why I abstain from it entirely. Yes. <laughs> yes, you do. You. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just going to fetch my cannons and preemptively. At this point, it's a total riot. There's violence. There's windows being broken, furniture being thrown around. Hitchcock and Thornton get help from all of the other professors and the sort of senior cadets. They start arresting people left and right. And by around six in the morning on Christmas morning, things have calmed down a bit. At 6.05, they play the Bugle Wake Up song, whose pronunciation we in this room cannot agree on. Reve or Revelli, 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 Revelli. Wake up, call. Wake up, <laughs> wake, wake up, bugle. Wake up, bugle. <laughs> but apparently, the sound of the bugle was mixed with quote gunfire, the sound of glass breaking, profanity by cadets, cries of pain, and threats <laughs> to academy officials. <laughs> Some of the cadets stayed in their rooms and continued drinking, but some went out and stood in parade formation despite being incredibly drunk. And then they had to go to chapel for a two-hour church service, a Christmas service, where many of them were either still drunk or, I would assume, profoundly hungover. Yeah. (laughs) Um, All told, between 50 and 90 cadets had been involved in the eggnog riot, which is also referred to as the grog mutiny. (laughs) (laughs) And they had caused about 168 dollars worth of damage which is roughly <laughs> so they like what are they, what is that like they, they scuffed a car <laughs> well it's, yeah it's roughly forty four hundred dollars oh right okay okay so okay, i mean okay. it's, that's not nothing but it's also like it's fine yeah <laughs> it's not even like a building i mean they, they also did try and kill a guy yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, right it's actually two two guys <laughs> so, it's hard it's to more about that isn't it that, really? on that yeah. damage yeah, yeah. Um, As you can imagine, this being a military academy, there was an incredible amount of punishment handed out, including people who were confined to their rooms for a month. People had to do a month of hard labor, labor, several students who were court-martialed and later expelled from West Point Mm -hmm. um, and therefore the army. But among those who were involved, there were a few notable names. Well, first of all, Robert E. Lee, famously mm. the yeah, yeah, yeah. general of the, uh, the, guy, the, the South in the Civil War. He was at West Point at the time, but oh. did not participate in the riot. Okay. Because he was a very Was he too good boy. busy avoiding Boss Hogg at the time? <laughs> Is that a Dukes Jump. of Hazard reference? Wasn't it General Lee the car? Oh, yeah. Oh, jumping over hay bales Jesus. and stuff. Wow, Ant. That is a... <laughs> deep cut. A deep cut. I can't go with you down this journey. I, we have reached the limit of my Dukes of Hazard knowledge. Uh, so Robert E. Lee was there, but he didn't participate. Jefferson Davis did, but since he went back to his room, he avoid a court martial, avoided a court martial. Uh, there were a couple of men who would go on to be generals in the Confederate Army. There's one who went on to be Secretary of State over the Republic of Texas. Oh, wow. Another who was the governor of Mississippi. <laughs> and then uh, my favorite, one who would go on to be a Supreme Court justice. Nice. <laughs> so, you know, just goes to show that even if you <laughs> threaten to kill your commanding officer, you too can still be a Supreme <laughs> Court justice. <laughs> I mean, everyone up to and excluding the two people who tried to shoot the other, the, their commanding officers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're. Just being good lads, aren't they? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just, just having just, a, just they're having on a lark. lash. Yeah, <laughs> you know what they <laughs> say. Christmas time fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that is the story of the grog mutiny, uh, or the Can you just imagine? Riot. 
the amount of effort and willpower it takes to just quaff pint after pint of creamy eggnog to yeah. get that drunk. This is why they went mad. Like if they had just been drinking <laughs> oh, the whiskey plain, yeah. they would have been, you know, a little rowdy and then passed out. It's the nog. It is absolutely. <laughs> the, the nog has done The nog this. is going to get you. The nog's going to get you. <laughs> Jeez. For this week, mm -hmm. dur during this episode, which is a Christmas special, yes. yep. I understand, I'm going to talk about the Stone of Schoon, mm. which is also known as the Stone of Destiny. Ooh. Uh, this is the stone that's been used for centuries in the coronation of the monarchs of Scotland. Yes. And also came up very briefly mm -hmm. in an episode. 1245, when you talked That's about right. the history of Westminster Abbey. That's right. Uh, so the Stone of Schoon is, unsurprisingly... A stone. A stone. Made, <laughs> made of Schoon. And I will now tell you the most important <laughs> things you could ever want to know about this stone. Yeah. Hold on. Sorry. Before mm. you do that. Yeah, thanks. It, to clarify, it is pronounced Schoon, but it is spelled S-C-O-N-E. That is correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, first up. It measures 66 centimetres by 42 centimetres by 27 centimetres. And it is, it is an oblong block of red sandstone. <laughs> now, yeah. bearing I have those, several questions. Yeah. Bearing those measurements in mind, which I hope you, you, you remembered. Oh, I've had to convert something to by Something by 27. So. 66 by 42 by 27. That's correct. Great. How much does the stone weigh? Okay, let me just work this out. Take here. a moment. Uh, I'm bear in mind it's red mm. sandstone not I uh, know you're very good on limestone and uh, my limestone the density limestone yeah. is I'm very... actually only good at measuring talc do you know, what, do you know I'm going to say 40 kilos 40 kilograms yeah I'm going to say based on your outrage 250 kilograms you are closest really Anna, I'm looking at Anna yes. Anna is closest yes it is 152 kilograms. Oh, okay. Yeah, it only okay. feels like okay. 40 kilos to me, though. Uh. You know? <laughs> that's, that's where I get it wrong. You've been you know? schooning yeah, I've been since, you were, since yeah, a wee yeah, lad. Yeah, yeah. Um, some other interesting facts. It's also known as Jacob's Pillow Stone and the Tarnished Stone. <laughs> uh, because uh, tarnistry, it turns out, is a Gaelic tradition for handing over power. And interestingly, oh. and this is a complete aside here, uh, but it turns out that this word and tradition is kept alive in Ireland, where the deputy head of government is called the Tarnister. Tarnister, yes. Oh. That's where that comes from. That is wow. where that comes from. So it, it comes from the Gaelic tradition of, of the, of, the tarnished. Tarn 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just an interesting huh. thing there. Very about. interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so a bit about the history, and then we'll talk about the link to Christmas. Historically, it was kept at Schoon Abbey in Scotland. Schoon in Scotland, which is near Perth. And it was seized by Edward I's forces from the Abbey during the English invasion of Scotland in 1296. Mm. And ever since then, it's been used in the coronation of monarchs in England, as well as the monarchs of Great Britain and the UK. Do they sort of like make, you know, do they make, are they going to make King Charles like step on this, on this schoon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's got to sit in it, I think. Yeah, just sit yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah it oh, goes okay. under the coronation chair. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I didn't know if it was just like, yeah, there's a cool rock in here. Everybody look at the rock for a minute. No, no, no. It because were involved. Well, because, because uh, ever since the Treaty of Union in 1707 between England and Scotland, mm -hmm. which uh, brought the two states together as equal states into union, mm -hmm. uh, the king of uh, the UK is also the king of, is of both England and Scotland yeah. together. So yeah, he has to, they place, the, they place the stone under the chair and he sits on the chair and then he's crowned as uh, wow. king of both. Yeah. Cool. Um, so who, who took the, the, the stone of Schoon first from Scotland? King Edward. Edward the right? First. And like, can you just imagine being the troops? You're going up to Scotland, you had a war, you won, and now you start pillaging and all your mates are, have got <laughs> bags of like loot and gold and crowns. Yeah, like women slung then, over their shoulders. Yeah, and then like, there's two guys just manhandling this big rock. 152 <laughs> kilogram rock. Like, yeah. All the way back down to Westminster. <laughs> it's like, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're not profiting from What'd that, What'd you bring they? back from Scotland, boys? Yeah. Stone. <laughs> the resale value on, on scrap sandstone is not high. Well, that's the thing. As soon, the second it comes off the lot, it loses half yeah, its it really value. <laughs> it was blatantly done as a punishment, wasn't it? Yeah, for, it really for some was. of those people. And uh, in 1996, the UK government decided to return the stone to Scotland, where it is now uh, kept with the Scottish crown jewels when it's not yeah. being used for coronations. And there are a bunch of different theories and legends about where the stone came from before it found its way to Schoon Abbey originally. So in one story, Fergus, son of Urk, 
the first <laughs> king of the Scots. Okay, sorry, you cannot just breeze past Fergus, son of Urk. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> Why, why is that interesting? I just love that combination of vowel sounds and <laughs> consonants. I'm just very tickled. Urk is a family name in my family. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not best pleased. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not saying it's I'm, a bad I'm, name. I'm saying it is the best name I've ever heard. <laughs> it's not really a family name. Um, it, but yeah, Fergus, son of Urk, is the first, <laughs> is the first, was the first king of the Scots from around about wow. 498 to 501. 498 to 501. CE, and supposedly transported the stone from the Scots homeland in Ireland to Argyll, where ah. he was crowned on it. And another legend uh, places the origins of the stone in biblical times, mm. classic, and identify it as the stone of Jacob, taken by Jacob from Bethel uh, while on the way to Haran, which is in a Genesis story, it turns out. And that it's the very same stone of Jacob that was then supposedly taken to Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah. Okay. So at least everyone agrees that it started out in Ar It was in Ireland at some point. Well, not everyone agrees okay. because somewhat contradicting these legends, geologists have categorically proven that the stone was quarried in the vicinity of Schoon. Oh <laughs> my God. Scientists, what don't they ruin? Yeah, so you can either believe the obscure legends or the scientists with their evidence. Or maybe there's a conspiracy whereby the actual stone of Schoon has been replaced by mm. a, re a replica from mine from school uh, well then... there are also a bunch of different theories about the idea that the original stone was hidden in uh, the river and that the edward the first troops did take a fake one down okay. to westminster but again wow it, it may be but they did take a stone that was quarried nearby um, or if that was me i would just be like yes i'll take the stone and then just find one close to westminster yeah. and be like oh yeah yeah this is the one i got it. carried it all the way down here boy it's been heavy <laughs> what so the on arc? to the link to christmas so on christmas day in 1950 four scottish students from the university of glasgow Ian Hamilton, Gavin Vernon, Kay Matheson and Alan Stewart stole the Stone of Schoon from Westminster Abbey in London and took it to Scotland. <gasps> yeah. And they were members of the Scottish Covenant Association, which was a group that supported home rule for Scotland. And so a few days before Christmas, the four students drove down from Glasgow to London in, <laughs> in two Ford Anglias. <laughs> and they got to London and Ian Hamilton hid under a trolley in the abbey being wheeled along to try and get in but was then caught by a night watchman after the abbey doors had been closed <laughs> so this abbey watchman this night watchman found this guy hiding under a trolley after yeah. the abbey had been closed yeah and he, he reportedly quote briefly questioned him and then let him go <laughs> <laughs> hiding under the trolley is like a classic, classic. way to get in oh it's right? like scooby-doo yeah. right yeah. it's hilarious. picturing like this you know waiter and it's got the yeah you know, the, the, the cloche the, the, and the silver cloche yeah. on top and it's like yeah the white things like, oh just leave this here i've got a <laughs> delivery and then and then he sort of comically sneezes as the guy walks past <laughs> yeah, or something. yeah like, exactly <laughs> yeah and uh, they finally then as a group managed to to access the stone later and they pried it out from under the coronation chair and it crashed to the floor and broke into two pieces uh, so they picked the it up the floor broke or the stone <laughs> yeah, the, broke the earth the is earth now broke into two broken pieces twain. <laughs> broke asunder <laughs> yeah. and hence why we have the two separate hemispheres <laughs> I mean, and ever like... since then and that's where the Greenwich Meridian comes <laughs> yeah, from exactly, yeah exactly and, and the prefer you know, now we've got way more bridges because that's of the true. Yeah. it's a big bridge I meant did the stone I'm what sorry do you I'm mean? really having trouble saying <laughs> Stone and schoon and not scone and stone. Stoon. Um, did the stone of schoon split in half or did the tile floor upon which it was dropped split? What do you we think is the worst outcome? of that <laughs> we, we, we actually don't know the status of the tiles but, but the, the stone broke in two all I'm saying is I'm asking the hard questions <laughs> the stone broke in two and then they took it up to Glasgow and hired a stonemason to fix it while they were still on the run I, I mean how do you fix a stone like other than like find cement. a stonemason no but like that's <laughs> what they do man no they make big stones into smaller stones you can't make Two stones stick together except for That's, cement. I think stonemasons would be offended by nope, your I mean, like with cement. How sure. very dare you? Well, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what happens. They used. They found a stonemason, and the guy was called a guy called Gray, and he placed a brass rod containing a piece of paper inside the stone to help so the, the rod mm. helped to connect the two sides of the yeah. stone together and then inside it he put a piece of paper but what is written on that piece of paper nobody <gasps> knows that's awesome isn't that cool i love that so much but 
w- why did he do that? Why? Because it's wouldn't really you? cool. It's really cool. No, but, you could write like fart on there and <laughs> no one would know. But like, you know, you can't just do that. You're professional. Like imagine you went to the dentist and like I gave you a filling and I wrote something inside there. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you what it is. You just but can't. He's, he's, he's the stonemason to people conducting a heist of a treasured... And if you that. can't trust them, who can you trust? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it took the police several months of hunting, uh, but in April 1951, the police then received a message and the stone was found on the site of the high altar in Arbroath Abbey, uh, where in 1320, uh, the assertion of Scottish nationhood was made in the Declaration of Arbroath. Oh. And the stone was then returned, obviously, to Westminster Abbey and in, uh, later on the following year, in February 1952. And ultimately, they made the decision not to prosecute any of the people involved in the theft because wow. they were worried it would all become too politicised. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And so there you have it. That's the Stone of Schoon and the Christmas Day 1950s. That's very, very cool. Now I want to know what is on that paper. What would you write in there if that was you? Well, you I already said it. I, I, would, I would write fart. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's got it's going to be something sort of pro Scottish independence, right? Do you think it's a a map to the where the real oh stone of Scone is? Oh my God! Bill, stop! I'm I'm so excited. To now. where the real stone of Scone was hidden <gasps> in the river in 1296. I, oh I think God. it's going to be like a warranty card or something like that. <laughs> it's actually just the bill for the yeah, for the masonry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, just write a novel about this. Yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> writing a novel currently about it as of right now and I've already got Nicolas Cage on retainer yes it's amazing can you imagine Cage doing a Scottish accent <laughs> <laughs> for an hour and ten minutes oh, so oh my good. god a Glaswegian I, accent I, I can't imagine it that. would sound a little something oh. like this oh, I was hoping one of you would jump in <laughs> I'm sure we could cut in there some actual Nicolas Cage accent of some sort <laughs> god that would be amazing that is a very cool that story that is very cool there you are. Well, that's it. That's Christmas, Christmas special 2022. It's Christmas through the ages. Well, thank you for joining us once again. That's everything you'd ever need to know about uh, Christmas, I guess. Yep, that's it. (laughs) There's nothing more to know until maybe next year. Maybe you'll see. Uh, If you have any questions or comments, as always, uh, find us on Twitter uh, or visit our website, randomlygeneratedhistory.com. And uh, one quick announcement here is that next week we will probably have a little bit of a Crimbo Limbo filler episode while we are all at home with our families and hopefully you are the same. But we'll be uh, back to our regular number generated year Mm -hmm. in January. And so it is therefore time to pick that year. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the first episode back in January will use a year generated by the illustrious random number generator which i'm firing up now mm-hmm. it has its own sound you don't need to make sounds <laughs> oh no that wasn't me being the rng that was just i'm so excited and this is how i'm expressing That's it the noise you make yeah. you're excited and and the year is 916 CE. Okay, 916. Nine nine I think there's going to be plenty from that year. Yeah, it'll just all be kind of grim, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Look forward to... <laughs> it's going to be great. grim episode <laughs> in We're the first gonna, week back in January. We'll be kicking off 2023 with <laughs> dredging up some stuff from the Middle Ages. <laughs> Brilliant. God, we're really well, bad at selling this. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. I'm so excited. Okay. Merry Christmas, everyone. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs>